Number one, it represents the body of Christ worldwide under the full authority of Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church. Let me give that to you again for those of you that take diligent notes. Number one, the word church in the New Testament has four specific applications. Understanding those four applications will help you to be well-rounded in your reading and understanding as to the value of the church from a biblical point of view. Number one, it represents the body of Christ worldwide and under the full authority of Christ who is the head of the church. Uh, as long as we're in Ephesians, let's go to Ephesians and the first chapter. Uh, just back up one chapter, if you will. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23 is where we find just one example, and there are other examples, but to give you for all four applications, I want to give you at least one passage of Scripture for your notes and for your further study. Ephesians 1, verses 22 and 23, God has put all things under the authority of Christ, and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church, ecclesia. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere with himself. And so the first proper translation, usage, of the word church, it can in the Bible refer to the church worldwide under the full authority of Christ who is the head of the church. Number two, the word church can also refer to God's people in specific regions. The word church, now remember there's only four applications in the entirety of the New Testament for the proper rendering of the word church. Number one, it speaks about the church universal worldwide. Number two, in some passages, it refers to the church in its regional aspect and God's people in that region. Uh, let's go into the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 9. And uh, go down to verse 31. Acts chapter 9 and verse 31 the church then had peace throughout Judea, Galilee, excuse me, Galilee and Samaria, and it became stronger as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord. And with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it also grew in numbers. And so Acts 9.31, we find the church, same Greek word, ecclesia, had peace throughout, and then it names specific regions where believers were encompassed. Judea, Galilee, Samaria, and it became stronger and grew. Number three, the word church in the New Testament was defined as a local congregation of believers. And so again, the word ecclesia, 114 times, in the New Testament, fulfilling the law of proportions for weighty, important matters in the eyes of God was given an application in four specific references. Number one, it referred to the church worldwide. Number two, it referred to the church in regions. And number three, it referred to the church as local congregations of Christians. Uh, let's go into uh, 1 Corinthians and the first chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. I am writing to God's church, Ecclesia again, in Corinth. I am writing to God's church in Corinth a localized congregation of believers. 
I am writing to God's church in Corinth to you who have been called by God to be his own holy people. He made you holy by means of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. And so again, 114 times the word church is found in the New Testament. It has only four accurate applications. It can refer to the church worldwide. It can refer to the church in regions. It can refer to a local congregation in a localized context. And number four, it was also used to describe a group of Christians that were assembled together for worship, for the teaching of the scriptures, and for the move of the Holy Spirit. And uh, would to God I had a little, little extra time because those three things in the verse that I'm about to give you from the scriptures really is the essence of what a local church should be doing. And that's the fourth application of the word ecclesia from the Greek in the New Testament. The fourth application described a group of people who were gathered together, like we often do all of these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later, doing the exact same thing, gathered together. But for what reasons? For worship, for the teaching of the Word, and for the unique move of the Holy Spirit. Uh, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, go down to verse 26. Well, my brothers and sisters, let's summarize. When you meet together, one will sing, another will teach, another will tell some special revelation God has given, one will speak in tongues, and another will interpret what is said, but everything that is done must strengthen all of you. Must strengthen all of you. And again, I want you to see the importance of the unity of the church. I want you to see that it was not an independent reference. Uh, as a matter of fact, let me give you a solid gold nugget. Don't miss this. And uh, perhaps later I'll share it in some of my other social media platforms as its own statement because it carries that much value. The word church was used in the New Testament always in the plural and never in the singular. So 114 times the word ecclesia in the New Testament translated in our Bibles as the word church, four applications. But all of those four applications have a commonality. And what is the commonality? It was always used in the context of plurality and never one single time in the singular. What do I mean by that specifically? Those who say that they can serve God without the church and stand on their own, separated from the church, dishonoring the church, negative comments about the church. Now, there are some churches I'm just being transparent. There are some churches in existence I understand why people leave. And there are reasons for leaving a church. As we get closer and closer to the rapture of the church, the Bible prophesied there would be an apostasy in the church and that there would be a weakening of the pulpit and of the sacred desk and preachers and teachers would prefer the applause of their congregations more than the approval of God. I get it. I've been in some churches, quite frankly, that I would never attend. So I'm not saying that there are not biblical reasons for leaving a local church, but I am going to show you as we go on in this study, you must never lose your, your honor and your love and your loyalty for the holy church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in the Bible it is referred to as sacred and holy and the bride of Christ. Christ called those who are true members of his church 
his bride. Now, I'm just going to tell you right now, if you're in my presence and you start speaking ill of my wife in my presence, we're going to go round and round and you're not going to like the outcome. I would never tolerate somebody slandering my wife in my presence. I'll just openly admit to you, I am not saved enough to promise you what may transpire should, should something like that happen. Well, how do you think Jesus feels when you or other people are slandering with no thought of what you're saying, slandering and speaking negatively of the church and saying, I'm done with the church. I don't need the church. I don't care about the church has never done anything, but all they want is your money. You know, and people slander carelessly, not realizing that their tongue is touching things that are sacred in the eyes of God. Jesus himself, God's only son, shed his blood and purchased us so that the church may be sustained. So the word church, wherever it is used in the New Testament, is always plural in context, never singular. Number two, what the church is not. If you're taking notes, we've already covered, covered number one, what is the church biblically from original languages, original history, what the authors wrote in context, properly interpreted, it is applied in the New Testament in four specific applications, always plural. Number two, what the church is not. Now, throughout church history, the word church has evolved to mean many things to many people. But oftentimes, the way people use the word church, it has strayed miles away from its true biblical and holy definition. So let me tell you what the church is not. The church is not just a building. Now, I'm not saying that if you tell your kids or your grandkids or you tell your wife, let's go to church, and you're referring to a particular building, I'm not saying that's wrong. It's pretty common in our culture and in our mother language to refer to the building that has been built for worship, for the gathering as the church. That's not wrong but it is not the pure definition of what a church is. Because in the Old Testament, we see the word Ichabod, and I'll not get into the story of that, but from the original language, it means the Spirit of the Lord had departed. There are churches, there's not a visible sign that says Ichabod, but in the Spirit, you can see it. The presence of the Lord has departed, and they have a building and they may call it a church, and they may refer to it as uh, a denominational name and, and call it church, but number one, the church is not a building. Number two, the church is not a social club. A lot of people love church, but they don't love it for holy reasons. They love it because they're lonely. They love it because of friendships. They love it because of free food. They love it because of the fellowship they have one with another. They love it because of music. They love it because of prayer. They love it because there's somebody there who will listen to the struggles they're facing and so on. But the church is not a social club. Number two, the church is not a social club. Number one, the church is not a building. Number three, the church is not a political organization. Now, I do believe that the church and believers should actively resist wickedness immorality, injustice, corrupt politics. I believe under the rapture of the church, the church should be actively resisting corrupted politics. But in some churches, that's all you ever hear. The church is not a political organization. Now again, I, I know some people might take that and run the wrong direction with it. I hope you heard what I prefaced my remarks with. The believer should resist political corruption, wickedness, ideologies from Satan and his children under the coming of the Lord. I vote. My wife votes. We believe in being functional American citizens. But I'm talking about those churches that almost every single service, it is a diatribe on some political platform and the church is not a political organization. Number Four, the church is not a denomination. The Bible forbids denominations. And again, I'm not going to be legalistic and harsh on that. 
But when the rapture takes place, God's not going to call people based on their denomination. When we enter into the eternal kingdom of God, there are not going to be angels in eternity's morning saying Baptists this way, Presbyterians over here, Catholics this way, uh, Congregational Church of God, all you Pentecostals way back in the woods where you won't bother anybody. We're not going to be divided by denominations in eternity's morning. In God, there is no such thing as denominationalism. There is only the blood-bought and the redeemed. I think you'll be surprised in heaven there'll be some people there you didn't think would make it from denominations that you didn't approve of. Because all that's required for salvation is to recognize your sin, repent of your sin, and receive Jesus Christ. And people have done that. They have recognized their sin. They have repented of their sin. They have received Jesus Christ in some denominational church buildings that many preachers would write off as apostate. God doesn't judge you by your title. He judges you by your testimony. And your testimony needs to be in agreement with the standards of God's holy word. And then lastly, the church is not a replacement for the Jewish covenant. In the world of theology, it's called replacement theology. And what that means in a nutshell is there are a lot of Christians who believe that because the Jews rejected Jesus as the promised Messiah, that God then rejected the Jews and turned his love and covenant and attention to the Gentiles. And that simply is heresy. It is untrue. God's covenant with the Jews is everlasting. His covenant with the Jews will be fulfilled down to the jot and tittle. The promises of God to the Jewish and to the chosen nation are in prophecy and God has not forgotten the Jews and he will not forget the Jews. The church is not a replacement for God's covenant with the Jews. Lastly, and I close with this, is church attendance a requirement to go to heaven? Well, when you speak of church attendance, we have, to, we have to make exceptions. And listen carefully to what I'm about to say because in a technical sense of the word, the answer to that is no. In a technical sense, listen carefully. Is church attendance required to be a Christian? In the technical sense of the word, the answer to that is not debatable. It is no. The New Testament does not enforce a legalistic standard of maintaining perfect attendance in your church. Let me just be blunt. You can go to church every Sunday of your life and die and go to hell. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. You're not saved by attending a church. There are legitimate reasons, and hold on, some of you are already upset and you're heat in your collar starting to rise, but hold on because you think I'm headed in a certain direction and I'm not. I am just saying that in the technical sense of the word, what do you say to the sick or to the infirmed who are going through some type of physical battle and they cannot physically get out of bed or get dressed or go to a church? They, they can't. They're at a season in life where they might be battling a disease or a sickness and they can't go to church. They may have gone to church faithfully their whole life. Are you telling that person because they went through a season of life where physically they were unable to go to church that now God is going to cast them into hell forever? That's just asinine. Also, sometimes elderly people lose their ability to drive and... Uh, their local church doesn't provide any transportation, and they're forgotten. And uh, there are some people, as they get older, some people battle various eye conditions. They can't drive at night. They can't drive in rain. They can't drive in bad weather. Uh, and sometimes the elderly are put in a position where they may have attended church their whole life, but they're at a stage in, in the fourth quarter of life where they're incapacitated for one reason or another, or they're limited. Are you going to tell those people who love the Lord as much 
at 85 as they did when they were 25 that now God forsakes them and judges them and casts them off because they can't get to church every single Sunday? Of course not. Uh, cái điểm chiếu xuống, điểm dưới trên này chiếu xuống đúng không? Bằng không hoặc điểm dưới này chiếu lên bằng không, được chưa? Và các bạn phải xác định xem coi nó đang đi xuống hay đi lên, đúng không? Nó đi theo chiều dương, chiều âm. Ví dụ như tại thời điểm này đi, nó đang đi về vị trí cân bằng, tức là nó đi về đây, được chưa? Và chắc chắn cái điểm như vậy nó sẽ đi ngược chiều dương đó các bạn, đúng không ạ? Vậy điểm M0 của ông ta nó nằm ở trên này. Thì tương ứng với cái góc này là góc phi nè Đúng không? Cái góc M0, O, A là góc phi đó Và góc phi trong trường hợp này nó là dương Tức là nó chuyển động theo chiều âm thì phi dương Còn ngược lại ví dụ như nó ở đây Nó đang chuyển động từ vị trí không nó đi về vị trí biên Đúng không ạ? Thì chắc chắn điểm M0 của các bạn nằm ở đây Và góc phi của các bạn là góc dưới này nè Đúng chưa? Góc dưới này đây Và góc phi trong trường hợp này là góc âm Thế thôi <cười> Rồi Cái yếu tố thứ ba là xác định ly độ Tức là tại thời điểm T vật ở ly độ bao nhiêu Thì các bạn dựa vào đồ thị Ví dụ như tại thời điểm T trên 2 đi Đúng không? Tại thời điểm đối với hình này Tại thời điểm T trên 2 nè Được chưa? Thì ly độ của nó đang ở đây Đồ thị nó đây chiếu vào ly độ X nó bằng trừ A Được chưa các bạn? Các bạn hiểu Ví dụ như tại thời điểm đây là 1T trên 2 Đây là 2T trên 2 Đúng không ạ? Tức là chu kỳ Tại thời điểm à, Tại thời điểm à, T đó Đúng không ạ? Tại thời điểm T nè Đây vị trí là T nha Tại thời điểm T Thì X của chúng ta Nó sẽ là ngay vị trí Đây nó ngay vị trí này Chúng ta chiếu vào trục OX Đúng không? Nó ngay bình dương Được chưa? Các bạn lưu ý điều đó cho thầy Nói chung đồ thị Nó rất là dễ các bạn nhiều bạn chúng ta cứ sợ về đồ thị Nhưng nhìn vào đồ thị là cho chúng ta biết được rất là nhiều điều Và bài toán đồ thị là một trong những cái bài toán Theo thầy đánh giá nó rất là hay Nó rất là thực tế Đúng không ạ? Nó dễ tưởng tượng Đúng không? Các bạn chú ý dạng này nha Và bây giờ thầy trò chúng ta sẽ đi giải quyết các bài tập này Xem coi nó như thế nào đây